Yeah, we're online. We're on now, I believe. Can I say hello? Audio? Yeah, go ahead. Hi, folks. Sorry about that. Yeah, we're good. We had some technical difficulties. Hi to all everybody, TikTok and Instagram. Tonight's topic is shooting boards. I have outlaid in front of me several shooting boards that we I use. We actually make them here too. So there should be lots of questions. This is the number one tool aside from your plane, I think. You want to start off, Frick, with a fire and a question at me? Uh, sure. Yeah, first one comes from Todd Michael in Leesdale, Ontario. Hey, Todd. Other than weight, do you see any negative aspects making a shooter shooting board out of swanstone? Um, any advantages? Is that what he asked me? Other than... Other than weight. Do you see any negative aspects? Oh, negative? Uh, well, weight would be the number one. I mean, you're, if I'm building something, I probably have that up on my bench two or three times an hour, and it just gets to be a pain reaching down and pulling it up if it's heavy. Huh? Yeah. Yeah, swan, swan sounds heavy. It's, it's about twice the weight of maple, so... I don't think I would use it. I don't think there's any advantage. I, I can't think of any advantages other than the fact that it's, it's uh, stable. But, I mean, not what's really stable? I don't... Uh, expensive, too. MDF is stable. Tis. Tis doesn't last forever, but, I mean, it lasts long enough. I don't... I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't choose to do, use that, but if you do, let me know what, what you uh, find. Next for oh by the way so this is our this is the little one that we use with the block plane which is sometimes comes in really handy just because of the size of it especially when you're doing small stuff when I'm fitting wedges for a through wedge tenon it's really nice it's really nice to have to be able to get close the gap isn't nearly as big on this as it is on the uh, larger shooting boards. Next question, Frick. Uh, Mike Evans in Powell, Tennessee. Where is he in Tennessee? Powell, Tennessee, yep. Hey, Mike. Uh, what wax or lubricant should I use on my shooting board? Uh, just because of convenience, I use, I use the same wax that I use on my plane. I'll just, you know, a couple of strokes on there is usually all that it takes, and that just... Allows it to move a little more freely. But you want to, it builds up too, and then it cakes and gets in the corner, and I just take my edge of my chisel and just run it there and clean it off. But it, it, it moves pretty smoothly anyway. I really can't think of times when it's so much resistance that I need the wax. So paste wax. Yeah, any, any of those. Paste wax that might actually be even better because you can wipe it on, buff it off, and it doesn't need it doesn't build up at all like this one would. Next, Frick. Uh, Anthony Steventon in the chat. He says, "Should Hi, I Anthony. should I use a, the same shooting board with a forty five degree and ninety on the same board or separate boards?" Oh well, so some people some people make a an attachment. So in other words, you would take a regular shooting board. And you put in an attachment, which turns it into. Oh, you know what, Jake? Why don't you grab the? Uh, why don't you grab the antique? <coughs> I think it's over in that corner. No, no, it is right there. Hey, they put in a, an attachment in there. The only problem is I find it has a tendency to move just a little bit. If you can get it rock solid, that's fine. I, I nothing like glue and screws to hold your fence in place so that it does not move. So that's my reasoning behind having a dedicated shooting board. But I'm going to show you one. I'm going to show you one that I bought locally. That's an old antique Stanley, and you'll you'll see that. I uh, only have one grip. Next, Frick. Um, Steve Decker in Centerville, Virginia. Hey, Steve. Would you consider making a variable angle shooting board with a movable fence? I'm going to show you this one. 
and it uh, it has an adjustable fence. So this is the Stanley number 50 or 51, which is which? Huh? So this is, what's the model number? The plane's 51. Oh, I'm sorry, it's 51 and 52. 52 is the shooting board. Now I'd have to clamp that in place in order to use it. Doesn't have a cleat on the front. But this has, doesn't have a whole lot of surface area. But and that's if what you, matters, Jerry. Yes, Jerry. Loosen that. Lift up the pin. There's uh, there is 90, 90 and 45. I thought there was more than that. Lock that down in and tighten it up. And that stays, that doesn't move. Doesn't seem to wiggle at all. So, I mean, you could. Uh, why, we don't, why don't we? Just because it's, a, it's an added expense. And I don't know how much of a benefit it is. It's nice that the fence moves this way as well. And then your plane sits in a track and you can move that track in so that there's no slop in there as well. The only downside to this is that it becomes a designated tool doesn't do anything else and I like the fact that I can use my five and a half I can use it on the bench I can use it on the shooting board and I don't know if there's any advantage to that being skewed either I mean when you can use your when you can use your five and a half or your six and it shoots the end of your end grain of your piece of lumber and it comes out nice and clean then you know what are you looking for what are you looking to improve I want to show you something that we made today <coughs> so we just shot a, a YouTube finished it today on making a wood hinge box with a real simplified joint so for people that uh, are a little timid to either Cut them with dovetails or go through the process of making a jig to do the box joint. We did this one, which is just a butt joint, but with one setting on a uh, router table with an eighth inch, eighth inch bit, you cut a groove in the, in the uh, end of this piece, pardon me, in the end of this piece, on the face near the end of that piece, and that same setup and depth cuts your groove in your pieces, top and bottom, to house your top and your bottom. So when you're done, you end up with, and we use Baltic birch. So the fact that you've got a little bit of birch here and a little bit of birch there, contrasting with the walnut, I decided to do the, I decided to do the hinge out of a white wood as well, just to uh, carry the contrast through. It feels really nice. And the, the size was a total screw up because I made something wrong and had to cut the pieces down, but I actually like the way it turned out. So you tell me, do you like do you like having the hinge out of a contrasting wood? And what do you think of the joint? And do you like the box? Always interested in knowing your opinion. What else, Frick? Uh, Mike Evans. Uh, hey Mike. This is another one from Mike. Can you please discuss donkey's ears for shooting boards? Oh. Well, I... The one that we use is right here. Over there. Is that it there? Yeah. For cutting a miter, this is for a flat miter. So if you think of a picture frame, you use something like this. And then for a carcass that's going to have, that is going to have a, uh, a miter joint, you're going to use this. Now, what he's referring to is a piece that you can add on that will hold, hold your piece up in the air up at a 45 degree. This, you simply, well, let's go in and cut it with, cut it with a saw. I need a bigger bench. 
And what's nice about what I'm about to show you is you can dial it in so it just comes out perfect. This really isn't designed to sit up this high and do this, but I should that, be able to do it. Is that saw going to go all the way through? No. Okay. Move it farther than that, would you? Well, I don't know how clean that was, but I got it out of the way. Again, I prefer the designated tool for the job same reason I don't have any I don't have any uh, combination machines I grew up using a shopsmith which I can't stand there always has to be there's always going to be some give when you're trying to do two functions with one tool and we put that in there and the plane the blade doesn't go all the way to either side, so the blade is going to run. The blade is going to run right here on that little ridge that you can see, and then there's one up on the top as well. Actually, it's right up here. What's that tick? It's a nervous tick. sharpening oh I'm, I'm by the way i forgot to mention how many people do we have on frick 428 so those of you who ordered a t-shirt from kim o'connor i should have explained she she makes them as the orders come it's not inventory coming off the shelf so she asked me to tell you that uh, they'll be start going in the mail this weekend and if you didn't get one and you want one, I also want you to, I want to read you this. So this is what Kim does. I don't know if I mentioned this, but she does this as a means of uh, a charity. I, I asked her to tell me exactly what, and here's what she told me. We donate 20% of all sales. So if you pay $25 for the shirt, 20% of that is $5. We do donate 20% of all sales to the first responders that serve our community. Currently, sales are benefiting the Virginia Beach Volunteer Rescue Foundation, which provides emergi emer emergency medical services and ambulance transport to Virginia Beach citizens at no charge. It is fully equipped, including the ambulance and all equipment, and runs solely on private donations and volunteers. That's a big deal. You often hear, you know, a percentage of profit. She's, she's giving them 20% of the sales. That's... That's worthy of everybody going out and buying another T-shirt. This is, this is mine. So 757 is the area code. This is the Neptune one. I like this one. Ordered one for me and Frick and, and Jake. Sorry, Irv, I didn't get you one. I'm just going to put a quick edge on this. I should mention that if you're using your shooting board, it's probably the time when your plane blade has to be its, in its peak condition. You're cutting through end grain almost always, and that's going to challenge your plane and your planing skills more than any other cut. If you haven't uh, tuned in and watched my 32 seconds to sharp, you get a good refresher course. Creating a secondary bevel. This blade's almost ready. In fact, this blade is. I may as well show you this too. So if you look at this, I'll show you how big the secondary has gotten. So when the secondary is that big, I can't see. where do you want me, need me to be? 
When the secondary is that big, it's time to go in and shorten it. I'm using a delta grinder. Nothing special about it. I'm using a, 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 a Wolverine grinding jig. Now I'm going to go in, I'm going to set that blade up so that it's mimicking the angle that was already on. I'm going to set the tool rest up so that it's mimicking the angle that was already on the uh, blade. Lock that in place. That thing not fastened down, Jake? I'm just going to spin this real quick and see if where we are. It's right about in the middle. I've got a CBN wheel on there. This is an 80 grit CBN wheel. It cuts really fast. You, uh, you don't need to spend a lot of money in your grinder. Save it for the wheel. What's really nice about this, it's almost, I shouldn't say it's impossible, but it's difficult to heat it up to a point where you would cause any damage. In fact, it's difficult to heat it up to the point where you can't hold onto it. Now, that's cold. On a regular grinder, I'd have already had to dip that a couple of times. Grinding wheel, I should say. You never have to address the wheel. It lasts a long time. So you put it on and then there's nothing to be done. So I'm, I've pretty much completely restored and it cuts really fast too. That's, that's the other thing, it's just lightning speed. There's just a little spot right down there that I didn't, I didn't carry my bevel all the way to. I like to have one continuous bevel, makes it a lot easier to locate when you're freehand honing on the stone. And this thing will run forever and a day. Okay, now I can come over here. That, by the way, is the number one reason why I regrind. It's just that the primary bevel has gotten too big. And you're spending a lot of time moving material that you shouldn't have to. What am I on, Jake, a 500 or a 1,000? Five. Jake and I share this station, I see. I prefer a 1,000. He likes a 500. So when you when you've just reground, chances are you're not going to get that edge perfectly straight, and that's what you're going to do with the stone. So if you look at that closely, I don't think the secondary bevel has gone corner to corner. Has it? Can't see over there. No, not quite. Needs a little bit more. Little tight circles. Light to moderate pressure. Probably the hardest thing to come up with or learn to do is to apply the same amount of pressure to every finger. Pinky doesn't usually apply a lot of pressure, nor does the ring finger compared to the middle finger or the index. Okay, so that goes corner to corner. Now I'm gonna step over here to my 16,000, locate the primary, come up just a little bit higher than I did on the last stone. About 10 seconds of work on the 16,000. Um, you should have clarified that there's a reason <coughs> you couldn't just check for the burr. You mean because there was already a burr from the grinding wheel? Yeah. Now I'm just taking off what might be left of any burr. Frick, any question? Any uh, comments on the whether or not they like that joint on the box? Yeah, actually there was. Good or bad? Good. I said the contrast looks really nice. What did you think, Frank? I thought it looked lovely. That's good. That's all that matters. Ken, forgot to mention. You forgot to remind me. <laughs> Vets. If you are a wounded vet that has been to our one of our 26 classes... 
and you're on tonight, we would love to give you a shout out. So in the chat, see you, Frank. Where's she going? In the chat, just put uh, at Ken and tell Ken your name and what class you were in and we'll bring back a flood of memories. All right. Now, there. See how nice and clean that is? So you get two surfaces like that. It almost looks like the end grain doesn't stop. I mean, the face grain doesn't, doesn't stop. It's so nice and clean. And it gives you a really good joint. And you can fine tune it so that it comes out at a perfect 45. How are we going to get another question without Frick being here? Oh, yeah. So the, the, these are the new hats. Got, it has the patch in front. It's got the logo on the back. And what else about it, Jake? It's, it's a different adjustable. style. It's adjustable, weren't they all? A little different color. This is we, we chose the, uh, the the khaki green for our uh, to throw a salute out to all of our military past and present students and friends. <laughs> um, something else I want to tell you too. What are you looking at? The back. There's a patch. That oh yes, yeah, check the patch. Speaking of patches, oh, yeah. so we got something we're going to do new. We, I'm not going to talk about it yet, but it's going to involve this. And it's going to involve all of the vets that come to our class here on out. Um, there was a question about what to do if a homemade shooting board isn't made. Frick, we're waiting on you because we don't know. No, have any no, I got, I'm giving you a question right now. What is it? <laughs> if a homemade shooting board doesn't come out square. If a homemade shooting board doesn't come out square. Well, if I had to fix mine, if I had to fix this one, and I determined putting a square on there, a reliable square, that uh, it was tilted this way a little bit. So that this, I have to lose some material here. The hard way would be to do it with a shoulder plane. You can do it with a shoulder plane because the blade goes all the way. So I would, I would put this in a, I would hold this firmly in the bench and I would go in and I would start planing right there. Irv, you were sneaking around, <laughs> slinking around. And I would take a pass. I would go from there to there, and then I would back up a little bit, and the next pass would be there to there. You want to make sure that the blade is is uh, projecting parallel to the or flush with that edge. So you press down like this on a flat surface, and that'll shift the blade over. That way, you're not going to mark up your face to the front of your shooting board. So I would start here. I would get the blade set so it's just a light pass. And I would make a pass across there. And then I would back up a little bit and I'd make another pass. And then back up a little bit more and take another pass and keep doing that until I get back to here. Then I would go in and check it with my square. And if it was correct, then all I need to do is I want to make sure that I have no transition marks along here. I would get my straight edge out. I think I may have actually dug into that. I would get my straight edge out to make sure that this does not rock. If it rocks, and every time you shoot, you shoot it's going to move. So that needs to be nice and straight. And if it's got a bump in the middle, then you're going to start right here. Light pass, and you're going to take just a, just a, you know, go from there to there. And then you're going to back up, and you're going to go from there to there. You're going to back up, and you're going to go from there to there. And then I would take one complete pass again and check it. So you can, you can adjust that once it's already in place. It's still doable. And, of course, if, if this corner needed to come down, then you would simply plane in this direction. Now... This also has to do with grain direction. You may have to do the whole process that way, but that's easy enough to do with your router plane, or your uh, shoulder plane. Now, ideally, you'd use something like this, if you have one. This is a, a 10 and a quarter. And it, I say ideally simply because it's bigger, it's easier to hold on to, and you got a little more reference surface. But I've gone in, I've gone <laughs> in and fixed shooting boards that we made that came out and they weren't perfectly square. So I've gone in like this and salvaged them. So it's You could do the track as well. Huh? You could do the track as well. Well, this is a lot easier. Well, if you have the right tool, but you could you could well, do the track most, with most a smaller people, shoulder. You, you could also use 
You could. Oh, oh you're saying run the run that along. Yeah, you run could do the that. Half inch shoulder plane. Yeah. You're which, limited. What's, what's Jake's Jake's saying is take this track, and you could move the track this way. Now the problem is that you're gonna you're going to you might eat up all your rabbit. You could also fix that, I suppose. But you're trying to make a straight shot with a little short plane like this, even a long plane. That's that's a little more of a challenge. I was going to say the other, I've got three planes here that I could use. That's a, a rabbiting block plane. That's my least favorite of the three. And then the shoulder plane and then the bench rabbiting plane, which is probably the best one. Next, Rick. Um, this one comes from Jerry Thompson in Newport Beach, California. Jerry? Mm -hmm. Hey, Jerry. How far can I stretch the uses of a block plane shooting board? Well, the only limitation on a block plane is that it's, its size. Well, ideally, you want length and weight. Why do you want weight? Well, it, you're cutting through end grain, which is a hard cut. So uh, the more weight you have, once you get this moving, the easier it is to carry through with some momentum. You want length because you can't... If I've got a large board to do, this would be more appropriate... If I have a large board to do, it's nice to get a run at it, but I can't start here because I, I'm going to smack into the side of that. So I have to be engaged with the end of the sole. So the more surface area you have from the tip to the blade, the more of a run you're going to be able to get that. So when it engages, you're, again, you're, you've got some steam to make it through. Put too many shooting boards out here. This is, this is the 18-inch variety of that one. Set that one down there. So more length I have here, better chance I have of making it all the way through. Don't forget, anytime you're cutting the end of a board, you've got to go in and cut a little chamfer. Now, time for a uh, time for a wee bit of a commercial. So Jake developed this. Tell him the story, Jake. I developed it. How long ago? When did you start working on it? 18 months ago. No, longer than that. It wasn't that. It wasn't longer couple than that. A couple years. <clears throat> we've, had them, we've had them for sale for six months. Yeah. So this is out of cast aluminum. Did, was Chris, Chris was involved? Chris was involved. Chris, our engineer friend, who's usually here. And uh, we call it the grip. It involves drilling a little hole in the end of your, on the edge of your plane. The hole is a quarter of an inch in diameter, about three sixteenths of an inch deep. Now, maybe you don't want to drill a hole in your plane. I say it's a tool, whatever's going to make it work better. The nice thing about this is you can position it anywhere you want. And I like to have my hand very close to where the blade is. I think that's where I'm going to get the most control, as opposed to being back here or up here. I want to be right there where the action is. Okay? It gives you lots of grip, as opposed to trying to wedge your hand down in here. It has two little set screws underneath here. Are you in close enough to see this? It has two little set screws. These are oval set screws. They have an oval tip. And you start the process with your plane by bringing these out a little bit. And I say a little bit, oh, I don't know, maybe three, three or four thicknesses of a piece of paper. This brass pin has a six, eighth inch diameter hole through it. So you're going to back this off. Pull it in so it's flush. There's a magnet on there just to help hold it. Get that where you want it. When you decide you have it where you want it, remember, your two set screws are sticking out a little bit, so they're holding this out from the edge of your plane, just a small amount. Take an eighth inch drill and drill down through this brass pin. That's your guide, and that'll give you a pilot hole in your plane. And then you can go over to your... The best way is to go to your drill press, put in an eighth, a quarter inch drill, and go down about 3 sixteenths of an inch in depth. Then you're going to wind this back down. And it's quite a tight fit, so you don't have to worry about that wiggling loose. Extend that all the way out. And then you come along like so, and then drop it down in. Now, if there's any slop at all, you can come in here, or maybe it's too tight. Maybe your drill moved just a little bit. But you can now back these off a small amount until you get it so that it does not move. So when I use it, I just come along like this. I catch that little lip. 
and then drop that in place. You're easy to come on and off, works really well. You want to, if you really want to improve the performance you have on your shooting board, aside from being having a sharp blade and a square side to the sole, get one of these. You'll love it. You can, and you can put it on any any plane that has a square side like that. Any any vets, Ken? Yeah. Do you have a mic? Yeah. Oh, it's working. Is it on? Can you hear him? Okay. Yeah. We got uh, Kent Boys is on. Kent, Kent, not a not a vet, but Kent is part of the. Uh, Kent is up in Ontario, and Kent is part of the. What do we call? Board of directors. The board of directors for the Purple Heart Project for the for the fundraising side of it, the foundation that that uh, is a five hundred one c three in the United States. And he was here on the class. And he was here, yeah, um, twenty twenty two, I think. Yeah. Uh, John Brown from Warmockto, JB, he's on. John, John's a Cana wounded Canadian vet. Hi, John. Kim O'Connor's husband's on. Kim O'Connor's, Kim O'Connor's husband? Yeah. Kim O'Connor's <laughs> husband, Jeff. Yeah. Happy birthday to Jeff, I'd sing, but you wouldn't appreciate it. Jeff just had his uh, 32nd birthday. He's feeling pretty chipper. Uh, Tim Pierce from September 22 class. Hey, Tim. Tim, uh, Tim and Jeff are uh, friends. That's how, I think that's how Tim found out about it, was through Jeff. Tim, great to have you. Vietnam era. Casper's on. Casper's on. Really? From way over in, in uh, Denmark. Yeah. Hence the flag. Oh, by the way, I got a full-size, well, a full-size one, but I've got, I ordered, I, and they had to be, uh, I was going to say flown in. Had to be special orders. I have a Danish flag, an Irish flag, a Canadian flag, an Aussie flag, and a U.S. flag. So we're going to put that all along the outside wall of our classroom to represent the different countries that we've had. And that's where he came from. And Colonel Jim Pearson from the September 24 class is on. Hi, right, Colonel Jim. Good to have you. <coughs> Jack Lane from the Bench Brigade is on. Jack, I sent somebody to you today. I had a fellow call me. Actually, I called him, but he uh, he's down in uh, he is down in Alabama, and he wants to be part of the bench brigade. So, by the way, if anybody would like to participate, I'll take just a second and introduce this. So, we started the Jake and I started the Purple Heart Project. Didn't have a name at the time back in November of 2016 and uh, something had happened where a customer had called looking for a saw turned out he was a combat wounded marine and uh, mentioned that ever since he got involved in hand tool woodworking it was the first time he'd found any peace from the physical and the mental pain he suffers from and I, uh, I felt my uh, the strings tugging my heart uh, no, military back no military background but uh, I certainly have appreciation for those that do what? We don't have a picture, Jake. What are you doing? What happened to our picture? I think the thing came disconnected, the wire. We still got audio, though. You can keep talking. All right. You going to get it back? I'm going to try. Jake, are you trying to get the picture back? Yeah. Okay. Anyway, so his name is Jesse Paradis, and that's how the whole thing started. So we did... Uh, we did a class in Niagara Falls, and then we kept doing them in Niagara Falls. And it was about three and a half, maybe even four years ago, that one day I came to realize that we were sending these guys home with some skill and some tools, but no bench. Okay. And uh, I started calling a few of them, and sure enough, most of them hadn't done anything because they didn't have a bench to work on. And I, it wasn't something that I was prepared to take on. We, I had my plate was full. And I'm not sure how Jack heard me saying this, but he did. And he got a hold of me. He said, he begged me to let him tackle this. And I said, I'm begging you to tackle it. So anyway, Jack has, um, because of Jack, we've delivered well over 100 benches. I think we're up around 140, maybe. 130, 140 benches. So civilian, or, or I just want to say civilian, volunteers, Agree to build a bench. We'll provide you. We'll send you the vice and the bench dogs. We'll also send you the plans. You build it to uh, our specs, the Cosman workbench. 
And then Jack makes arrangements so that, if at all possible, the builder can actually deliver it to the vet at his home. So that's why we need a network of builders so that we can always be, hopefully be close enough to the vet so that the two can actually meet up. So if you would like to do that, and uh, it's up to you to procure the materials, it's not a big expense. And I will say that I think everybody that has done it has wanted to, co has, has wanted to come back and do another one because you, uh, you really get a, you really get a good feeling for doing something like this and helping these people. Anyway, let us know, we'll, and we'll put you in touch with Jack. Hey, Jim, Goldeneye Jim. Hey, Mike. Brent, right here, right behind me. Andrew, Andrew's up in Idaho. Haven't heard from Andrew. No. Isn't, isn't Andrew Whitaker from Idaho? What's he? What? Andrew's Andrew's my friend. Stump stander. Okay, tell me, tell me, trigger my memory. What? What? What year? Andrew was here with uh, class twenty-five. And he was with his school in Kyle. Oh, when they were, they came back to us. When Kyle came back to assist. Yeah. All right, I'll go when. Yeah. And everybody, and there's still a few in Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay, who was the who was um. Carlos? No. Yeah. Memory's fading. Welcome. Mike Cook, Mike's so Mike's over in uh, in uh, Nova Scotia. Mike's Canadian. Ralph Sutton, August twenty third. Big Ralph. Hi Ralph. John Wellens, July twenty third. Hi John. Devin Wright, two thousand seventeen. Devin is uh, working with Luther and helping in the uh, in the uh, managing the the vets that we bring into the class, which, by the way, we just notified. I made those phone calls in the last two weeks to the the first group of 2024, which will be the April class, May class, June class, and July class. So, thanks, Devin, for help. And a special guest, Artis Benson. Artis, Super Dave's mom. Hi, Artis. Okay. What did you want to say, Frick? You jumped up and Edmar. down. No, I was Who? talking to Urban, but you can Edmar. mention the Florida Edmar. classes yeah. later. Pardon? Oh, yeah. No, I can do, I can do several things. So uh, two things real quick, and then we'll go back to questions. So we are, for the first time in ten, over 10 years, I think we're offering three advanced workshops this year. And these will be, it's a drawer-making workshop, so it'll be a, it'll be a challenge. You had to have had the training the hand, so it doesn't matter what year you took it. Uh, the class has room for 12 in each. I'm not sure how many spots we have left, but the class dates are on the website. I know there's one the end of May, one the end of July. Okay, thank you. Um, also, the end of March, the last weekend of March. Frick, you come up with the dates for me, please. We're you never told me. March, to March 28th, we are going to be at the Woodcraft Store in Orlando, Florida. And that evening, from 6 until 9, I think is the time, we are doing a special presentation just for uh, veterans. Uh, I'll, I'll include uh, active duty as well. And this is going to be, this is designed to just give you a taste of hand tool woodworking and a little bit about the Purple Heart Project so you can find out more, or in most cases... I'm talking to the people who know someone. You can get them there and find out more about it. And then on the uh, Friday, which would be March 29th, is that the hand plane? Or I think it's the hand plane. It's going to be a hand plane seminar all day, including your lunch, the tuition. And we'll cover everything from uh, setting up your hand plane to sharpening it to using it, shoot, focus on shooting boards a little bit. And then on Saturday, the following day, it's going to be dovetails. Three dovetails in the morning, half blinds in the afternoon, lunch, and there's a special if you take both classes, and uh, they're filling up quickly. I know that one is. I talked to Robert, the manager, just the other day. So if you want, you need to contact the Woodcraft Store. Can you put a link up there, Frick? Find a link for the Woodcraft Store in Orlando. 
And then the following weekend, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, we're repeating the exact same schedule at the Woodcraft store in Clearwater Beach, Florida. And you can contact that store and hopefully Frick can put those numbers up there for you as well. Don't forget, Kim O'Connor is very generous, helping out first responders in Virginia Beach. Go onto her website, which is the stripedtomato.com and get yourself one of these lovely t-shirts. Oh, by the way, and it says, that's right. So we're, we're going to do this thing where we're going to do throw our weight behind worthy causes, whether it's the uh, spouse of a combat wounded vet or if it's a combat wounded vet. And on the sleeve, it'll say, uh, supported by RC, and then it's going on, on yours, going to say RC Woodworking. Anyway, I think that's just a, I think that's a fun thing to do. And of course, right behind me, I have Angie, who's watching and making sure I don't make any mistakes. Angie and her sister Lynn do all the packaging of our Purple Heart T-shirts. You can get three different ones. There's a turquoise one that says "Wood Doing Good" on the back. There's a green one, an army green one that says "Wood for Good." on the back, and then there's the blue one, the navy blue, that says, wood is good. Hi, Ange and Lynn. Okay, Rick, next. All right, next one. <clears throat> um, Giving away prizes tonight, too, by the way. Bruce Butters in Point Claire, Quebec. Hey, Bruce. Should the right side of the fence be fractionally shorter than the shooting board width? Should the right side of the fence... Should the right side of the fence be fractionally shorter than the shooting board width? Ken? Should the right side, I'm, I'm assuming he's talking about this. With this fence, so yeah. Should, say, read it again, Frick. I'm trying to digest this. Should the right side of the fence be fractionally shorter than the shooting board width? Uh, yeah, I, explain means, explain to me what you mean. Firewood. This piece? Yeah, but the, should the fence be Should the fence he's be talking shorter? about this design here. Like you want your fence to be in. Oh, uh, you know, you oh, 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 yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, I got it. Thanks, Ken. Yeah, what happens if you try to bring this all the way over? The first time you have your blade for a heavier cut... You end up tearing off the backside of this, and it gets destroyed anyway. So we purposely hold that back a little bit, which was wh which was what I was saying. Um, well, actually, that's about the same as two, although it's a little bit closer. So yes, hold your fence back a little bit so that it's not touching the end of your plane, so you don't end up planing the end of it off and tearing it all up. Yeah, sorry, that took a minute. Rick, next. I mean, this is a very yeah. generic question, but Greg Rice in Colleyville, Texas says, what are the common use cases for shooting boards? Kind common like, use cases? I don't know, maybe projects you use them on the most? No. Or? Well, here's the way that I always, oh, here's a classic example. So today, or when did we shoot, did the, yesterday, Jake? We did, we did a video on this box. And as I said, we wanted to keep it really simple. So it's four pieces of wood. This piece and this piece had to be the exact same width and length, and this piece and this piece had to be the exact same width and length. So that's easiest, easier done on the shooting board than anything else, and it had to be perfectly square, because if it wasn't, when you, when you glue these pieces together, the spline is going to follow the end of the board, so it's either going, something's going to be off, and you go to put it together, and it's going to be twisted. So the best thing about a shooting board is the fact that you can square up that end without any great amount of effort. Now, if I didn't have a shooting board and I wanted to make a little box out of this piece of wood, I would put it in my vise. I would treat the backside so as not to blow it out. Now I've got to balance my block plane this way and this way. And although that's possible, it's a lot of work because of the fact that you're literally up here in midair on a narrow piece of wood with a heavy plane trying to get that just right. And it would be a series of going in with your square and checking to see. And if it's not correct, then you got to go back and redo it. Well, you do need to know how to do this because there will be times when you can't bring your board to the tool. 
you have to bring the tool to the board. The opposite of that, or the, uh, the option, I should say, to that is you have a shooting board that's been built, and this is, you know this is square. It's square in this direction, and because your plane is set up properly, it's square this way. You bring your board over, you cut your little chamfer on the far side, you flip it over, you take one or two passes. You should check it anyway, but you can pretty much be guaranteed that it's going to be square to this edge, and it's going to be square to that face. And that goes a long way in building anything, because everything you build is always going to be a sum of the parts. So this door that's going to attach to this tool cabinet, if those ends are not perfectly square, when you put the fourth corner together, you're having to pull it into alignment. And the minute you have to, minute you have to pull the two pieces into alignment, well, then you know it's not going to be, it's not going to be square. There's, it's going to have a little bit of rack in it especially when you do a drawer. So best thing about a shooting board is the fact that you can automatically square things without having to uh, fuss like I did, balancing the tool on the edge of the board. And of course, then we have one for cutting 45s. We have one for cutting miters on a, on a, a flat miter, a wide miter. Anything you can do to hold the piece and keep it in a fixed position between the tool and the workpiece. Hi. Next, Frank. This uh, is Royce. He can't. They can't see him. This is Royce. He is uh, grandson number seven. Soon to be outdone by by Jake's next one. Say hi. He's not Number usually two. this quiet. Huh? <laughs> he's not hit this quiet. Yeah, he's not normally quiet. All right, Andy Carson in the chat says, is it possible to make a shooting board that works for both block and full-size planes? Uh, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I could, use my, I could use my block plane over here, sure. That's going to work. Uh, let, me, let, me, let me give you some features about our shooting board that you can incorporate if you want to make one of your own. In fact, we, I'm sure we've done a YouTube on making a shooting board, so no... Uh, you know, we're not holding our secrets. First thing that you're going to do is choose the right materials. So what we've done is we chose the piece of MDF. Why? As Jake mentioned earlier, it's stable. It also has a hard wearing surface. So although it's not going to last forever, it'll last for a long time. It's nice and hard. Um, the second piece of material is a piece of Baltic birch. When it comes to using plywood, the nice thing about Baltic birch is all of the components... All of the layers, if you will, are made out of the same material, birch. So on this piece of eighth inch, you've got a piece of birch that's running this way. In the middle, you have a piece of birch that's running this way. And on the back, you've got a nice piece running that way. So it's solid wood, even though it's, it's uh, put together in numerous pieces. So high quality. What the, option of that, the opposite of that is you buy a piece of uh, regular plywood and they use a weed for the inside core, and then you put the, they put expensive veneer, which is the thickness of uh, tissue paper, on either side of it, which... That's, that's what they were trying to say about Andrews. Andrews is the one that stood on the stump. Oh! <laughs> okay, now I remember. Um, so that's, that's the uh, second piece of material. The third piece of material is the fence. And you want that to be a really hard wood because it gets slammed a lot. No matter what you're doing, you're going to be slamming that with your board just because of the plane. We use Osage Orange. It's relatively inexpensive, but it's really hard. Ken will attest to that. And then there's a cleat here, and this is a piece of walnut, and that's simply there to hold the board from going forward when you're planing. Now, how do we build it? Well, you'll notice that there's a little rebate or a little rabbit cut right here. If you have to look in real close, I'll get Jake to come in with the camera. Recognizing that on your bench plane, the, uh, the blade does not go all the way to the bottom or the top, in this case, when I'm holding it like that. So that little... That little rabbit right there... You'll see it right here. That's designed to run just below your blade 
So that never wears out. You're never chewing away at that when you're playing. The fence, I always keep the fence forward a little bit. Here's why. Uh, a lot of shooting boards I saw had the fence way back there. When it's way back there, what, especially when they're new, they would be doing this, and because they're always pushing in this direction, they end up spinning around like that, which just makes for an awkward planing. So by bringing the fence forward, now you have a little tail right there that keeps the blade, uh, the, fan, the plane, going in this right direction after the blade clears the board, just cleaner and nicer. Um, I keep the fence back. Some people move it right up to the, to the uh, plane, and that's fine until the first time you have the blade advance a little farther, and then when you do that, it's going to plane the end of that, and then most likely it's going to break pieces out here, and it makes a mess. So I purposely hold it back, and I hold it back a little bit over here as well, just make it a little neater when you're handling it. The uh, final thing that I can think of is that we, we form these over a little mold, so there's a slight curve like this on the pieces. If you don't do that, and if you try to clamp them flat, usually they end up cupping for whatever reason. And when they cup, here's what occurs. If, if the plane is sitting on a flat surface, it stands square. However, if there's a little bit of a belly in there, in other words, it's concave. Uh, I'm just going to put something. What, because of the shape of the plane like this, it's going to rest out here and out here. And when you do that, now all of a sudden the plane leans out and you're no longer square. So since I can't guarantee it to stay flat, I purposely put a, a convex bump in it. And the convex bump means it's always going to be riding on this wide spot. Wide spot. So it's always going to stay square to the, this portion of the uh, shooting board. And if you can do, you can, uh, do all those steps, you can make yourself a great shooting board. If not, we make them and sell them. Brandon uh, Patterson, who was working here for almost a year? A year in April. Brandon uh, makes, spends a good portion of his week making shooting boards, so uh, we're happy to send you one. And we send them packaged such, oh, such that they'll survive. What do you do? Lose the, lose the video again? Why can we keep doing that? Blank again, Frick. Sorry, everyone. Yes, we are. Audio is still good, though. I'll ask you this question. Okay. Jeff uh, Schnab, 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 in the hey chat. Jeff. He says, What is that. the best way to adjust if the result of shooting on a self made board is not quite perfect? What is the best way to adjust if shooting on a self made shooting board is not perfect? Yeah. What do you need, Jake? Uh, no, I don't think, uh, say it again, Frick. I'm wondering if it's, uh, what is the best way to adjust if the result of shooting on a self-made board is not quite perfect? Well, uh, rather than adjust, I, I wouldn't do anything temporary. Are we, are we back on? Yep. Yep. I would do it permanent. And that's just a matter of going in and, and making sure or getting the face of the fence to be square and when I do that, I always do it like this. I actually square it with a nice, long, big square. Where's my big uh, square gone? I haven't seen it in a while. Doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. Just wondering where it is. And I, I, uh, I use that as a means of determining if that is square. And, and uh, just wind up, wind back a little bit. We, we talked all about that, how you can go and do it with either a shoulder plane or a... a, a um, Rabbiting block plane or the bench rabbit plane. Jake made the mention that you could actually do it by working on that this part of the of the fence as well, but you want to keep that nice and straight. So I would suggest you do it on this. Next, Frick. Uh, Randy Kane in the chat says, "Is hey, it Randy. A, is it a good idea to wax the surface of the wood where the plane rides?" Yeah, uh, if I was going to do that. I would, uh, I would wax it with a paste wax, put it on, wipe it off. Then you don't have any uh, excess film to build up, and that'll run smooth for a long time. Or in our case, we, we spray these with lacquer, and that makes it nice and, nice and uh, smooth. Easy, always easier to do the edge of your plane, too. 
Next, Frick. Uh, Jim's got a good question, Jim Pearson. He said, often the sides of planes are not square. How do you compensate that the sole is not actually square to the face of the shooting? Yeah, good question. Well, <laughs> we, we have... Right away, though. No. Assuming they can't send their plane to right. us. Tell you what we do. We have a big 30-inch disc sander, monster of a thing. And we sell Wood River planes everywhere but in the U.S., and we go in and we square the sides. Um, that Trying to do that at home is not going to be terribly easy. What you can do, and the only pain about this is now when you go from shooting, I when I'm working on something, I bring the shooting board up, I shoot three or four pieces, and then I'm back to planing an edge or planing the face, and that process plays out multiple times. So I like to not have to adjust the blade in my plane. But you do have some lateral adjustment in your plane iron, and you can compensate. So if this is out, if this is out, uh, uh, you know, two degrees, you can swing your blade over in order to compensate for that. Now that means that you're probably going to have to swing the blade, come in here, make a couple of test passes, check it with your square until you get it right. Aside from that, um, wow. I don't know. I don't know of another a simpler solution, or I don't know of a simple solution. I can't imagine it being bad enough that you'd want to actually tilt this part of your shooting board. That's a tough one. If it's really bad, I would check. And it's a fairly new plane. I would check what the specs are supposed to be on your plane. You may have a case to return it. Um, I know we do that for people if you want to send it up, but that's an expensive venture. Just the shipping in both directions is enough, but if it's not too bad, we can certainly do it. But you do you do what you at least need the right side. If you're right-handed, you're going to want the right side of your plane square to the sole. If you're left-handed, you're going to want the, the, the left side of your plane square to the sole. I just I can't imagine going in and trying to do that with sandpaper on glass or sandpaper on a piece of MDF. That just seemed like an awful lot of work. Next, Frick. Uh, next one comes from uh, Ralph Sutton. Hey, Ralph. <clears throat> in Jefferson City, Missouri. I know Ralph. He says, to make a 45-degree mitered shooting board, is it better to angle the workpiece or the hand plane? Um... He, I assume he's talking about this one. And I think it's better, you can't use, it, can't use that on this. I think in this application, it's a lot easier to control by having, by having the plane on an angle. Because you can only imagine if that board was any size, trying to, you know, and, and that's not unusual. If I was doing a chest of drawers, if I was doing a chest of drawers and the chest stood 40 inches high uh, out of solid wood and I'm trying to miter it, if I did it in here, I could put it in, I could pad out this side of my bench by that same thickness, put the board in there, and I can go ahead and plane it without a problem. But to try to have something 40 inches sticking up in the air like that, I would do the plane. And the nice thing about this, once you make one, if I need it to be wider, it's easy enough to make. It's not that difficult. Um, we haven't, are we going to make these? Oh, yes. Maybe someday. Possibly. So let me go through and just tell you what I did. Start off with a square piece. Really love MDF for this. This is a one inch piece of MDF. And if uh, you square up your piece and you can make it as big as you want, excuse me, square up your piece, cut a notch with your table saw. And uh, then you're going to put a fence on the front and a fence on the back. And that's going to have a 45. And you got to make sure that that's right on. And then you're going to flush that up and attach it front and back. And I just make it so that instead of cutting a, uh, instead of cutting a little rebate like we did over there, the plane blade itself will cut that rebate. And obviously, it's going to leave a little area right there that will run below your blade. And it's going to leave a little area up here. Now, I also, you can, might be able to tell, I've gone in and I've saturated that MDF with uh, cyanacrylate or super glue just to stiffen it up so it would run longer. 
And then I've got a couple pieces here on the top to help support the whole thing. And that's it. Easy to go, easy to do. And you got a cleat on the front to keep it to keep it from moving when you're when you're shooting. Next, Rick. Uh, Bill McPherson wants to know. Hi, why, Bill. <clears throat> Luther's gonna kill you. Why are the hand plane shooting grips? Who runs this only, show? We only, run this show. Only for bevel down planes. Say that again. <clears throat> oh, why are the hand plane shooting grips for bevel down planes? Why are the hand plane shooting grips for bevel down planes? <clears throat> why are they? Only for bevel down. Well, because <coughs> um, would this not fit a uh, a bevel up? Oh, because they don't have enough. Well, one of my one of my beefs with the uh, bevel up planes is that they don't have as much surface area here, which first of all doesn't make them very stable or not as stable. And then we make this to cover a certain amount, but I mean, if that was hanging over a little bit, it probably would be fine. I never even I never even checked. To see, I'm not a fan of bevel down planes at all, but I think you could probably mod you could probably easily make it fit. That'll fit anything that has a square a side that is square to the sole. So I'm sure you could put it on there. We, uh, I'll just give you the measurements so that you know, and you can determine how much it's going to stick out. So this, the widest spot of this is two inches. So. Actually, that hangs out. This is this isn't quite two inches. So, when that s sits in there, like so, right there, I mean, it hangs over just a little bit, but not enough to bother you. So, I think you could do it on the bevel down plane. Bevel up. Bevel up. Next, Rick. Are we, can we have keep one of these in the queue so we don't have to wait? Yes. Yeah, I'll tell you later. So as soon as I do this one, you get the next one ready, please. Okay, Jim in uh, Phoenix, Arizona. Does angling yeah. or ramping the shooting board improve performance in any way? I'm sorry, I didn't hear the first part. Does angling or ramping the shooting board oh. improve performance in any no. way? No. No. So uh, you look in some of the old books, I think sometimes this is just theory. And what they did is they, they actually built the shooting board to be a ramp like this. So that when you, your, your, that wasn't ramped, this part was ramped. So when you ran your plane over the shooting board, it was, uh, it was utilizing, instead of, am uh, I playing this right now? I'm utilizing one quarter of the blade, one quarter inch of the blade. But if I had it on a ramp like that, it would go from a quarter to maybe three-eighths of an inch of the blade. The idea was you were using more of the blade. A shearing cut, nah. The blade is sharp. You're not going to notice any difference. And the work that goes into making the ramp compared to just resharpening maybe one more time for every 10 times, I don't think you'd even get that much out of it. It's not enough of a difference. Wouldn't bother to do it. Don't think it adds anything to it at all. I think it's just something that, an idea somebody came up with and they wrote it somewhere and that was it. Not, I can't see any reason why to do it. But if you do and it works great, I'll be the first to hear. I'd be, I'd be, I'd be the first one to be interested in hearing. Next, Frick. Peter in uh, Oceanside, California. Peter in Oceanside, California? Yep. Hey, Pete. I bought one of your 45-degree boards but haven't Today. used it yet. Being in California, should I store it indoors to mitigate any cupping that may occur? Um... Uh, it seems that not everybody does this, but I, I live in, a, in an area where we have dry winters and very humid summers, hot and humid, cold, dry winters. So I've always had my shop, uh, I've, I maintain the humidity and the temperature. So if you don't do that, you're really, you're really asking for trouble on the wood that you store. Remember, I've got... Uh, I've got thousands of dollars worth of wood in here, and if I allow the humidity to change, all that wood's going to start sucking up moisture. And then I go to build something, and it goes into a dry environment. It's going to give off that moisture, and it's just going to create a problem. So I keep all that under control, and I would suggest for the price of a dehumidifier or a, a little air conditioner, I would, I would do that. So, yes, 
the answer to that question is try to keep the environment that you're woodworking in at a constant, or at least as close to a constant um, temperature and humidity as humanly possible. Rick, uh, Ken, who did you say you had? Oh, Jay Bates, yeah. The, uh, big shout out. So I just got a quick little recap. If you weren't here last two weeks ago, I didn't look like this. My hair was halfway down my back. And family came and said, you can't stand it anymore. Would, I think it was Frick that had the idea. He said, what if we, what if we uh, got donations or drew donations off of you getting your hair cut? He said, uh, okay, pick a number. So he said 10,000. I said, that's not enough. So anyway, before we actually started the show last sat uh, two Saturdays ago, we were at 12,000, and we ended up at 26,000, so all the hair got cut off. Now, why was I about to say that? Oh, and uh, um, yeah, before I mentioned Jay, uh, Wood Whisper and Wood by Right. Wood by Right, both were kind enough to send that out to their people to up our, uh, mem our viewership. I think we had 880, 880 folks on. We raised a ton of money. So big thank you to them. And Jay Bates, I contacted Jay three or four or five years ago and uh, sent him a saw, and he was going to review it, and uh, life got complicated, and he forgot. Felt bad, didn't have to. So we decided to uh, buy another, uh, buy a brand new dovetail saw and joinery crosscut. And uh, he did a raffle with the proceeds going to the Purple Heart Project. We heard about it and we decided to kick in dovetail marking knife, Sean Shim, marking gauge, dovetail marker. And the uh, check was received today from Jay for the exact amount, Ken, drum roll. <laughs> $6,458. That's a huge donation. Thank you, Jay. Just so that you know the numbers, each class we do, we do six classes a year, seven combat wounded vets in each class, and each class costs approximately $52,000 um, to run. So uh, we're over $300,000 each year in what it costs to actually, and, that, and we don't know, we have no idea what it's going to cost this year because food prices rose up radically last year and airfare airfare just skyrocketed but that's not going to stop us from doing it that just means we may need to we may need to uh, find more people who want to participate so a big thank you to everybody that made two weeks ago such a great success and a big shout out to Kim too for doing what she does for first responders show her a little bit of love order a t-shirt and I love I, I, this feels great I think it's awesome and be part of our, be part of the RC woodworking family that supports these military families in particular. Ken, what are you about to say? Uh, John Beck, from June 22 class. Hey, John, there. Vietnam vet. And Kevin Burris. Kev, uh, Afghan. I don't, Kev's, I think, was Kev Afghanistan only? I don't know if Kevin was in, uh, he must have been Iraq as well, but Kevin was EOD. Army EOD. I, uh, I work with Kev twice a week. We uh, have a business group. So if you're ever looking for something, if you ever have a, if you have a date in your life that really means something, should talk to this more Valentine's Day. What Kevin does for us is he does laser engraving on both granite and slate. I prefer the slate. So we've had several, if you look above me, we've had several of these plaques done um, that are all, all around our shop, and Kevin will do it, customize it for you. He can do anything from pictures to uh, to um, script, whatever you want. And that is Burris Woodworking, B-U-R-A-S woodworking.com. And I should mention that Jeff, Kim's wife, okay, sorry, that was an honest <laughs> slip. Kim. Kim's husband, I'm going to hear the end, I won't hear the end of that. Kim's husband, Jeff, does, uh, makes all kinds of stuff. Famous for his shave bowls. Ken loves his. I love mine. And uh, check his site out at uh, O'ConnorWoodworking.com. They're in Virginia Beach. Kevin's in upstate New York. Next, Frick, please. Uh, I don't know. Hosean? 
in Cleveland, Ohio, says, why don't you use a dedicated shooting plane? I'm sorry, say that again? Why don't you use a dedicated oh. shooting plane? Yeah, real simple. You see my bench? It looks like this all the time when I'm working. Uh, there's a uh, hundred things on here. In fact, when Jake and I film a lot, and uh, usually we have to shut the camera down for a minute just so I can clear the bench off. So I am a big fan of having one plane that does as much as I can possibly get out of it. So it works really well on the shooting board. It's my favorite plane, general purpose on the bench. It's long enough to be heavy enough to easily move through wood, yet it's short enough to be manageable. Now, when I say that, if you can imagine trying to use a number eight for everything, this weighs over 10 pounds, more of a workout than I need right now, and just cumbersome on the bench. Fantastic on the shooting board, by the way, because you have so much mass. You have so much... Surprised Jake hasn't drilled a hole in it yet. You have so much weight and so much length between the end of the sole, uh, the end of sole of the plane and the blade that when you're getting ready to power through something, you've got all of that run. You're up to speed by the time you hit that and it just sails through. Better than any shooting board plane just because of its size, but cumbersome. Cumbersome to be using anywhere other than when I definitely need a plane that big. So my primary reason and answer to your question is I want one plane that will do everything so that when I'm switching from one to the other, I don't have to have a dedicated shooting board plane set up on another bench somewhere because there's no way I'd ever be able to work with that parked anywhere on my bench. And that's, that's that. Next, Frick. I got another one. Frick wasn't ready. Oh, yeah, Frick. I am ready. This is, this is from the chat probably 20 minutes ago or so. From Merwin904. Merwin? I don't know. That's just or Merlin. Just, just, no, Merlin just with the engines engine. and the Spitfire. He said, any way to keep the plane from tilting towards the shooting board? Yep. Yep. Yep, yep, yep. That's one of the cautions. So let me let me let me hit the basics on using a shooting board because I didn't. First thing you want to do, I don't care if you see this, think this is a commercial or not. Get one of these. My goodness, it makes it so much easier to use. So when you're using a shooting board, I'll use this piece of wood as an example. It's a piece of walnut. There's lots of. Um, there's lots of, uh, how can I say this, directions of force that have to be applied in order for this to work. Just give me a second while I fit this in here. You want to keep the board flat on the shooting board. You want to keep it tight to the fence. You want to keep your plane tight. You want to keep your plane tight to this fence because the minute you let that move away, you've lost your square setup. You want to keep your plane standing plumb. You want to keep the board fed into the plane, because if you don't, it's going to stop cutting. So you're always going to come in here first and cut that little chamfer, then flip it around. You can see the gap it creates right here. Now, when I'm doing this, I'm pushing the, oh, and I forgot to mention that one, you're pushing the plane forward and back. I'm, I'm consciously keeping that my weight here straight down so that I'm not leaning this way or leaning that way. And interesting that you should ask that question because uh, we have shooting boards that we loan to people when they're teaching the class. And they'll always come back and they've taken off this corner because instead of doing what I think they should be doing, because if I, if I just keep planing like this, let me move it out a bit. If I don't do anything to this, I just keep it here, I eventually no longer making any cut. So instead of pushing this like this, what they're doing is, in trying to get that to engage, they're leaning the blade, the fence over, plane over, and that's why they end up taking off the top corner of that. Okay, Maple, beat it. Um, so let me go through one more time and ex explain this. Keep your, plane, keep your plane standing plumb. Make sure the force is going right down through the middle of it. This helps to disperse that. Keep your plane tight to this fence. So when I'm pushing forward and pulling back, I'm also keeping it tight this way. The action of the plane cutting into the wood is going to keep the, keep the uh, board tight to the fence. 
You want that to be nice and straight. You want that edge to be straight. So before I would even do that end, I'd flip it around like this and make sure that I have a nice straight surface that will touch that and won't rock on me side to side. Now, the action of the plane will keep that tight to the fence. I've got to keep my hand on here to keep that tight to the shooting board, which by the way, that's one thing I really like about this. So what you can do is you lower that down, leave it like that, and now you're free to be out here, but that keeps that sitting tight to the fence. So that is actually a nice feature back over here. We're tight, to the, we're tight to the shooting board, we're tight to the fence. We're pushing this way. We're always pushing this way with a little less force than we're pushing the plane this way. So I'm moving forward and back. Always gotta keep that chamfer ahead of my cut. I'm moving forward and back, keeping it tight to the fence, and I'm keeping this pushed in to the plane so that I'm constantly feeding wood into the hungry blade. Okay, that should answer that question. Next, Frick. Lane Carter in Edgemont, Arkansas. Wayne? Yeah, yep. Lane. Hi, Wayne. Lane. Lane. He wants to know who named it a shooting board and why does it have that name? Uh, I spell, I've seen it spelled C-H-U-T-I-N-G, shooting board. Um, well, I don't know where the history of shooting an edge comes from. But I would assume, I'm, I'm guessing, uh, you're shooting an edge, and this is a board, this is a device that's going to help you shoot that edge or shoot that end, so hence the term shooting board. That's my, uh, that's my final answer. Next, Frick. Uh, Ron Gir Girardin. Oh, I, I, sorry, just before you say that. I, also, I, I don't give credit to my daughter. My daughter Erica makes dinner for us every night before we have the live. Tonight we had her famous chicken stew and homemade rolls, and it was fantastic. I'm uh, trying to suck my gut in because I ate too much. And my wife helps out, and so does Megan, Jake's wife, so community effort. Um, go ahead, Frick, sorry. Ron no. Girardin in the chat. I, I'd say his name again. Ron. Ron. Hey, Ger Ron. Girardin. He says, what are the best dimensions for a shooting board? Well, there is no best, but I'll give you some suggestions. Obviously, the longer it is this way, the greater capacity you have. And I say that, you know, you really can't start much farther back than this because you're going to be falling off. So um, unless I'm doing a chest of drawers, where's my measuring tape? Let me see what I, can, what I can get here. I could somewhat comfortably plane... Well, if I had to, I could do 18, an 18-inch 18 wide board. So that, this could actually be a little bit longer. We make these to ship. So, you know, the smaller it is, the easier it's going to be to ship. As far as the width goes, ours are 12 inches. I don't think you need anything more than that. Uh, remember, this is something you're going to be lifting up, putting back and forth all the time. So this gets a little tiresome if it weighs a... 25 pounds. I have a little piece like this. This no longer fits this shooting board. I think this one does. I just made a little device like this. Nope, that's my actual shooting board. Somewhere in here, I'll use this as an example. I just have a second piece like this that I can put. If I'm, uh, if I'm planing a wide board, I'll put that over there and that'll support the other end of this so that it's laying flat over here. Um, Ken, do we sell more of the 18-inch shooting boards than the 24s? Yeah. And I'm not sure why people gravitate toward this, but you want it to be obviously rest on your bench, too. Kind of hard to have it way out there. However, I have, I have a couple shooting boards over here that I made. Once you, once you uh, get using these and realize how beneficial they are, if I have a project and I've got something really wide, I'll crank out a shooting board to do it because it's worth it. It um, makes the task so much easier and so much more accurate. So the width, 12 inches is wide enough. The length, the width of your bench. I guess those are the only two dimensions that really matter. Next, Rick, please. <clears throat> uh, Christopher Hurst in the chat. 
So will you guys be making the grip for a block plane? Uh, don't think so. Yeah, it, has that, it has that lever cap. Yeah, you'd lose your block plane. But you don't need it. Yeah. I mean, this doesn't... Th yeah, th you're right. This You do have that if lever cap. If you're in a situation where you need the grip for your block plane, don't use your block plane. Yeah. Well, I only use the block plane for really small parts, and the thing one that comes to mind most often is when we're doing this. This was the video that we released, and we didn't do it. Where's the one where I didn't... Uh, right here. I didn't glue it in. Where are you pointing? End of that bend. Yeah. So when I'm, when I'm doing the wedges and I want them to fit just right, so I'm planing a little wee piece like that, I find it a little easier to do when you can take your block plane and go in there and plane that small piece so that it fits in there just right. Don't want to be too wide because you'll notice it because it'll push out beyond the edges of this rectangle. Don't want to be too small because it'll leave a gap. You want to show up, you want to end up working just like that. So, yeah. Don't ask more of your, and, and the, this is a small plane too. I mean, you got to, that's a lot of force to push that through a big heavy cut. You know, even going through something like this, that's just, that's, that's more me than I want it to be. I like that because it's more the plane than it is me. Next, for Can please. you flip your mic around? Why? Something like that. Next, Frick. John Adams in the chat says, "Can I cut ninety degree and forty five degree slots in the shooting board fence, like a bench hook, so the shooting board can be a multiple multiple?" Yes, you can. Tool? You can. The only problem is, I find that uh, you want it to be held fast. You don't want it to move. So when you're doing something that's removable you may not always get it to stay perfectly set it's uh, a best example i have a good friend mike smack up in ontario and mike had a uh, i won't say the brand name but mike had a combination machine expensive i think his machine was twenty thousand dollars when he bought it and it was a jointer and a planer and a table saw and a tenoner and may even been a few more things and the uh jointer in order to make it a jointer, the table came down. In order to make it a planer, you lifted the table up like that and you ran your boards through. Same cutter head worked on both. But no matter what you did, this minute you would lift up that table on the jointer and set it back down, it would never line up perfectly and you'd have to go through and fuss with it. And this was an expensive machine. My point is, I know that fence isn't going to move. That's going to stay true 45 degrees. I know that fence is not going to move. That's going to stay true 90 degrees. But when you have something that you're putting on, taking off, there's a good chance that it's not going to stay that way. Maybe you can make it so it does. That metal one over there seems to work fine, so not to say it's impossible. I just, I prefer to do it like this. Many more vets? Ken? If you're a wounded vet that's been to our class, just tuned in, give us a shout, say uh, down the chat, uh, at Ken. And uh, tell us your name and what class you were in, and we'll give you a shout-out. If you're interested in advancing your woodworking skills, and you've already taken our Training the Hand class, we are offering three advanced classes this coming year. One in May, one in July, and one in October. And it's a drawer-making workshop. It'll be six days long, and you'll learn to make piston-fit drawers and the case as well. There's 12 in every class. There's still room. Check it out on our website. If you're in the Florida area, we're going to be down there teaching classes end of March in, in uh, Orlando at the Woodcraft Store and the first week in April at the or Woodcraft Store in Clearwater Beach. Next Can't one. wait. Uh, Todd in the chat says, what are your thoughts on using a low angle plane versus standard on a shooting board? Well... Um, first of all, there's a little bit of a myth. And the, uh, the myth is that the low angle has a lower angle of attack. That really isn't true. I'll tell you why. The blade in a low angle plane 
sits, there's no frog, there's just a milled surface. That milled surface is 12 degrees. The blade is the, the bevel is turned up. So if you're factoring the angle that you're actually meeting the wood, you've got to factor in all of those. The blade holding angle, 12, plus the bevel on the blade, which is an, another 25, which is 37. And almost all of us use employ micro bevels so that we're not stuck polishing a great big wide surface. Micro bevels usually add up to five or six, maybe even seven degrees. So let's cut that in the middle and say six. So you've got 37 plus six is 43. This blade is cutting at 45 degrees because the bevel is on the bottom side. Frog holds the blade at 45 degrees. That's all you have to factor in. So you're talking about a two degree difference. You think that's going to make a difference? No. Sharpness of the blade is far more important. Now, read that to me again, Frick. I got a little carried away. Not that I, I never do that. Uh, I got rid of it. Um, 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 Irvin, would you be so kind as to get me a glass of water, please? Thank you. You don't remember what else? Uh, I was what you said. What are your thoughts on using a low angle plane versus? Oh, Standard right. Range. And the, the other thing is, if you look on most low angle planes, there's not, as much sur there's not as much weight and there's not as much surface area on the side, so you don't have that stability factor. So for that reason, I just think the five and a half or the six, um, uh, I'll clarify that. There's your five and a half. There's your six. The, everything is identical with the exception of the fact that the six is... Two and a half inches longer in the sole. That's the only difference between the two planes. So when I say five and a half, you can almost make that interchangeable with the six. I think that's your best overall plane on the shooting board. I, I keep up in the number. So on my uh, right behind me, I have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. 11, 12, 13. I have 13 planes. I can't tell you the last time I used that one. Maybe if I tried real hard, I remember the last time I used that one and that one. This one, it's been a while. This one, cannot remember. Which don't remember. That? Four and a half. Okay. Don't remember, don't remember, don't remember, don't remember, don't remember, don't remember. Yeah, this one, every time I use a plane. Easily 90% of the time that I'm using, thank you, easy 90% of the time that I'm using a hand plane, I'm using the five and a half. Excuse me. Now would be a good time to point out that we just started our President's Day sale. We did? We did. When's President's Day? Monday. So it's like President, President's Day weekend. Well, we don't have a Prime Minister's Day, I guarantee you that. Uh, so the sale is 5% off of a $50 purchase or 10% off of a $100 purchase or 15% off of any $250 or more purchase. Well, you guys know how to make things complicated. That's some pretty heavy math. Ooh, Guy like me wear my pencil out trying to figure that one out. The more the better. That's all they need to know. So I have a little something for you. I was listening to a guy, uh, uh, doctor that I listen to a lot over in England, can listen to this. I was listening to him today, and he kept saying, uh, so-and-so says. He said, so-and-so says this, or says that. So how do you pronounce S-A-Y, Frick? Oh, by the way, Frick's our English major. Ugh. Frick, how do you pronounce S-A-Y? Say. Put an S on the end of it. Says. Really? What's the rule with uh, vowels? Don't know. <laughs> that, All I know is that why in Canada we say says. It's wrong. Well, how could how could adding an s to the end of say turn it into says? So the English are right. Says that's one up for John. By the way, his name is is Dr. John Campbell. <laughs> you want some really good health advice? Check him out. Next, Frank. Because the things he says are right on. <laughs> I'm going to start saying that. <laughs> All right, Tom. Nothing else to Tom Blanchard first. in the chat says, Tom, <laughs> yeah, that's right, Frick. Go ahead. Will you ever have the vertical miter shooting board for sale? The vertical miter shooting board. Um, will we, Ken? 
You know what? Maybe we, we should get back to that. We'll experiment and see if we can come up with uh, come up with one that that uh, we're comfortable with. We uh, are we tapped out? We're not tapped out, are we? We've got capacity. Mm -hmm. What are we? What are we just about to start making? Oh, we just started selling uh, uh, moxin vices. The moxin vice is all ready to use, and uh, that's going to keep somebody employed. So yeah, we can we can probably find that. Jake, can you put that on our to do list? Ken, would you as well? Oh, I'll start playing around with that. I'm sure we can do that. Good, good. Kyle Kyle Perrell said, John Campbell be season. Be what? <laughs> be season. Well, most of the chat says that I'm correct. So you take said says. Take that. Well, listen, it's it's. What's the other word that we heard, Jake? That he, I. Controversy. Yeah, I, I I like I I really enjoy. Oh, I got to tell you about who I just talked to this week. I really enjoy uh, uh, World War II history, and the English always present a contro controversy. 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 Instead of controversy, and um, they've been around longer than we have. So I just want to I want to tell you this real quick because I'm excited to go meet them. So somebody, I, I apologize for not being able to give credit because I can't remember who it was. Said, "Hey, Rob." You might want to check this out. It's right in your neck of the woods. So this was a World War II vet who last Friday turned 100. And he landed on D-Day, Juneau Beach, June 6, 1944. Fought all the way through World War II. Got out of the Army in 46, went back in in 49 and fought in Korea. Stayed in the Canadian military until 1971. His son fought in Afghanistan, and his grandson fought in Afghanistan, actually got injured in Afghanistan. So I watched this video. It's on YouTube. If we can find a link, I'd love to put it up there. And uh, I sent him off a message, but I didn't hear anything back. So he's only an hour and 45 minutes away from me. So in the video, it showed the name of the retirement home he lived in. So I called him, and I wanted to speak to his son, but the guy who answered the desk says, well, I'll just have to put you through to him. So I spoke to him, and wow. I mean, even in the video, you see... I thought the guy was 75, not 100. Still drives his own car. So I asked him, I said, if I came up there, do you think we could, I could come in and shake your hand? Because to meet somebody who landed on, put uh, boots on uh, Juneau Beach in 1944 would be nothing short of amazing. So Al, Al's my buddy, Al, uh, Al, Al McNeil, who is a, a combat wounded vet himself, he works here. We were just out in uh, Edmonton, Al and I, doing some training for another something I have to talk to you about. And Al and I, Al's going to come up with me, and we're going to go see him, and I hope it's going to happen this week. And my dream would be to be able to bring him down here and have him show up during the class sometime and, and have him speak to the uh, soldiers here. Wow. That, that's, that's something that is, literally has all but slipped through our fingers. There wouldn't be very many of them left. Um, Ken, remind me to bring up Sleeping Heavily Peace in the next uh, <coughs> few minutes. A couple, they, more vets. a couple more vets to say hello to? Who are they? Uh, Ray Door. Ray. Cool Ray. And, Hi, Ray. Uh, and Doc Bailey, who was also... Doc Bailey. That goes, Doc goes back all the way to uh, 2017? Yeah. Doc was Vietnam as well, and he was a, uh, he was a medic. He was actually an, an, a Navy corpsman, if I remember correctly. I haven't heard from him in a while. Nice to see. Nice to hear from you, Rick. You have a question? Sure. Mike Dosek in the chat says, hey, Mike. "Whenever I use my shooting board, it moves around on me. What's the fix?" Glue, clamp. I often, sometimes, if I'm if it's not a big piece, I'll just do that. I'll pull a bench dog up and keep it there. But if I'm doing any amount of it, I'll put a clamp over here and hold it in place. It's just one less thing to have uh, have to worry about. But that's the, that's the simplest yeah, solution. Advice, yeah, you can do that too, or just uh, yeah, clamp of some sort, whether it's your bench dog or or, uh, or an F clamp. They would like to hear your pronunciation of that soft silver colored metal. Lead? Stay, no, A L. Aluminium? Yeah. <laughs> that's the British way. And where, and where do you park your car? Where do I park my car? In the garage? And what is overhead of us? 
Uh, schedule, not schedule, frick. What about overhead of us? Overhead of us, the roof? No. Ceiling? The roof. The roof. The roof. The roof. The roof. The roof. Somebody, somebody help him. <laughs> I think the Lakers fans say rough, rough. Uh, well, I just, I, when I heard John say this the first time, first time I've ever heard him, says. And then I got thinking about it. Well, yeah. The only way you change the sound of an A from a long A to a short A, you have to stick a vowel on the end. And they didn't do that. So check that one out. They just it. created the language. We perfected it. Right. Okay. That's what I says. <laughs> you ready? You like it, don't you? <laughs> no. It probably worked better in a song. It's like the last letter of the alphabet. What's the last letter of the alphabet? Z. According to everybody but the United States, Z. But because Sesame Street did that little rhyme, Z works better than Z. But the last letter of the alphabet, ladies and gentlemen, is a Z. And then they, somebody always says, well, how do you spell it? <laughs> so they'd say, what, so what do you call it, a zebra? I said, no. Just because, I mean, think of the, word, the letter W. The sound of the letter doesn't have to be the sound that the letter actually makes when it's used in a word. All right, we're getting we're drifting away from wood. Come back, to bring us the rack around, Fred. Uh, Sue Winston in the chat says, Hi, Sue. "Can you use a shooting plane like the Lee Nielsen Fifty One on your shooting board without modification?" Um. Yeah. Why not? Yeah. It's got that same little, uh, I mean, it's got that same spot down at the bottom that will run on there. Yeah, you could do that. A lot, far more stable, right? You got a lot more surface area. Okay, Mike in the chat says, do I need to change my blade's angle when shooting end grain? No. No. So I'm going to say this again. Performance of your plane, whether it's in a shooting board or in any other application, is 99% the edge quality, the surface, the, the uh, sharpness of your blade. Nothing else matters. Nothing else makes any difference unless the blade is sharp. And if you have not mastered that, then you're not getting anywhere near what you can be getting out of your plane. So I have a video called 32 Seconds to Sharp. That's not clickbait. That's how long it takes. I say that because I have students that spend three or four minutes doing it. And the problem is, if you're doing it freehand, three minutes, fatigue is already set in. And now, instead of holding the blade at close to that angle, you're starting to rock forward and back. You're wearing out your stone. 32 seconds is all it takes. You do the first stage on the core stone, 500 or 1,000. You determine if you've done that completely by finding a burr. If you have a burr that runs corner to corner after, thir after 10 seconds, you're done. Then you move over to the 16,000 and you repeat the process, only you go up a few degrees beyond where you were on the first stone. You spend 10 seconds. At the end of 10 seconds, you maintain what you're doing. You just push down with this finger for three seconds, and then you push down with this pinky for three seconds, so that what you're doing is you're feathering this corner, then you're feathering that corner. So if you put a straight edge on that edge, you'd see a little bit of light here and a little bit of light here, and now when you take a pass a on a wide board where you're having multiple overlapping passes, you can't feel any demarcation from where one pass overlapped the other. Now, let me, let me throw a sales pitch in there too that'll make sense. And I really get excited when I see people buying our sharpening equipment. The reason is I know that they'll be able to go home, follow, what, do what I do, and get the same results because they're using the same equipment. And... Um, you know, I, I know if somebody can figure out the sharpening thing, they are going to have so much joy and peace in their woodworking because it just changes everything. I saw, uh, saw an Instagram video that uh, Jeff O'Connor released the other day, and it was just him planing a board. And I was talking to him this week, and he said, I didn't know anything about planes until I take Rob's class. He said, now it's such a source of tranquility in the shop. And until you've actually done that, wow, it's just... Every stroke, it just seems to just take a little more heat off the situation. Next thing you know, you're just in la-la land. So get some la-la land. Buy good equipment. There's a sale on right now. You can get 15% off, Jake, if they buy... Well, if they're buying a, if buying a, a kit of sharpening good, you can get 15% off. What a deal. 
Get the equipment, do exactly what I do, and there's no reason why you won't get the same results. And you'll know when you're there because it'll just put a permanent grin on your face and you pull out that shaving. I want to spend a minute talking to you about something. So Dave, what's Dave's last name, Ken? Miller. Dave Miller from South Dakota. Came to our class, what month, do you remember? August, September? It wouldn't have been August. September, have, September. And Dave came to me on the first day, and he said, Rob, I came here for a special reason. It wasn't just for the wood working. I said, okay, fine. So I, I don't know, at some point during the week, he pulled me aside, and he told me about this charity that he had just gotten involved in, actually four years ago. It's called Sleep in Heavenly Peace. You want to check them out. It's sleepinheavenlypeace.org. And what their mission is, is to make sure that no child in their town sleeps on the floor. The alarming statistics are that in North America, although they say 4% of those I've spoken to says it's more like 10 to 15% of the children in your community are sleeping on a cold floor. They don't even have a bed to sleep in. A lot of this is a result of domestic violence and situations, obviously, that the child has nothing to do with. But yet they're the ones that suffer. So uh, he said in that little town they lived in, and I hope my numbers are right, of approximately 20,000 population in the last four years, they have built and delivered 2,000 beds, and there's still a waiting list. So uh, we looked into it shortly thereafter. I said to Ken one day, Ken knew about it. I said, you know, we got to do something about this. I said, but I don't have time to run this myself, and you probably don't either. So Ken and I are, are going in as co Co-chapter presidents. Co-chapter presidents. <laughs> and then uh, I think I, uh, I shanghaied Al pretty quick. Al's coming in, and Al's going to... Al's, is Al going to be in charge of... Build day. Build day, yeah. So uh, Al and I just came back from Edmonton, Alberta. We were out there last week, and we spent two days. On the Saturday, it was a build day. And I called a bunch of the vets that have been in the program because I thought, you know what? What better next step for these guys that have learned some woodworking skills than to put them in a position again where they're actually contributing to a measurable difference in the lives of other people? So uh, uh, Mike and Mike out there and Freddie and there were several other vets, but of the ones that came to our class, I think those were the three because there was only... I think there's only four out there right now that have been to the class, and the other guy I, I didn't see. But uh, they came. We spent three and a half hours. There was 20 of us, and we built 10 beds. It's a very, very simple process designed so that anybody can do it. But you build and deliver beds. And when I say a bed, I mean the completed bed, uh, the mattress, the bedding, pillows, the pillowcase. And uh, it's just a... Uh, it's. It's so needed. You think about a child's development if they don't get a good night's sleep. Think of your own, how you're hampered if you don't get a good night's sleep. So the sad news is, I think, of the, at the time when we first found out there were four chapters in Canada, I think there's, we're, we're going to be number seven or number eight. There's some others that have just come online. I don't think any of them right now are accepting, applica accepting uh, applications for beds because they're all so far behind. The Edmonton chapter, it's actually in Strathcona, is behind by 300 beds. They told us, they said, when soon as you turn it on Facebook that you're doing this, he said, you will be flooded. So hopefully this week we're going to get our, first, we'll have our equipment, It's not, not a big equipment issue, but there are some pieces that make it a lot easier, and we'll have our first build this week. So I'm imploring you, if you're looking to do something meaningful, especially you vets on here, sleepinheavenlypeace.org. You can check it out on YouTube and see lots of information about it. But I promise you, it'll, be, it'll put meaning in your life like I don't think anything else could. And I will continue to talk about this. Please get a t-shirt from Kim. Help somebody who really is dedicated to helping first responders in her own area in the Virginia Beach. You can go to her website, uh, thestripedtomato.com. Frick's put that up there. Show her some love, and she'll turn around and send 20% of that off to help uh, emergency services in that area. Rick, I didn't even mention we're giving away some prizes tonight. Where are we with donations, anybody? I think we're not. $1,303. $1,300? Ooh, I think we took the wind out of everybody's sales last two weeks ago. I'm going to have to grow my hair again. <laughs> Please, no. <laughs> Maybe you grow yours, Frick. Grow a beard instead. <laughs> no, I can't stand that. That itches. 
Uh, well, we got time for more questions. Throw them at me because you were late getting us started. We were five minutes late. No, three after minutes. Evan, or eight minutes. Kentucky Iron and Wood says, please show how to use your workbench for shooting longer boards. Oh, oh, you know, good, good, good. Good. That, who, who brought that up? Kentucky Iron and Wood. Kentucky. My, one of my favorite movies was uh, Last of the Mohegans. And Daniel Day-Lewis, Daniel Day-Lewis, is that his name? Yep. Refers to uh, Kentucky as Kentucky. Just a little trivia there. So if you've got a really long board, too long for your shooting board, you can utilize your bench. I don't know if I, dis I don't think I discovered this, but uh, I'm sure somebody at some point along the way did. I didn't, I don't remember ever seeing anybody do it. So first thing we need is a piece of, this is the place where you want to use a piece of MDF. Quarter inch would be fine. I thought I had a strip right here. No, it's not MDF, but it'll work. So I've got a piece of uh, Baltic birch. I'm going to lay that on my bench. I've got my bench dog. And now I need a long board. Oh, there's a nice piece of you. Who? You. You who? Y E. So how am I going to shoot this edge on this long board? I, now, I could put this in my vise, right? Have the option of doing this. And you need to learn how to do this because there will be times when you can't do what I'm about to show you. And now you're going to come in with your plane and you're going to shoot that. Now, here's the problem. While you're trying to straighten this edge, you're also having to keep it square to the face, which isn't always easy to do. So instead, what I'm going to do is put my plane down here, put my grip on, set this board down like this. The piece of plywood is getting it up off of the bench so that it'll get up into the blade. Huh? You could clamp it. You could clamp it. I don't, I don't, I find I don't need to, but you may want to. Don't want that drop. So keeping my hand here, I can come along and I can use the bench like a shooting board. And it's doing two functions. It's keeping the edge square to the face. And it's also helping me get a nice straight edge. So now instead of having to check with my square and going back and forth, I can end up getting a nice square straight edge using my bench as a shooting board. And that's the place where you'd want to put a little bit of wax on there. I, we use that quite often anytime we have a really long board. That was a, I'm glad you brought that up. Thank you. Next question, Frick. Uh, Alfred Borg. In Hi, the Alfred. Chat, oh, we're going to sell something tonight too. Remember, Jake? We don't need to sell it. We can, that can be the giveaway. Oh, give me a gift? I'm going to give away my dovetail saw. So this is a dovetail saw I've been using for the last couple of years. This is a new material that we're now making our, our handles out of. 2,500 now. Oh, we're 2,500? Good. I wouldn't say a couple of years. I would say six months. A year? Well, okay. No, no, it's been more than six months. Mm -hmm. Didn't you get those? Anyway, we didn't have one-inch material, so we had to take two half-inch pieces and glue them together. Made the handle. I really like it. We've switched over, and it's it's a great material. It's actually made out of wood, believe it or not. And uh, anyway, but there's a you can see the seam. There's a visible seam there. Still a good saw, but I got to have perfection on here. So I uh, I decided today we were doing something. Jake and I were working on the tool cabinet, which I'm going to give you a little tour of. And I said I need a new one. I said oh we'll give that one away tonight. So somebody will get it. I'll sign it for you. And it still cuts well. Next, you're, I'm, I interrupted you, Frick. You were about to ask. Yeah, Alfred question. Borg in the chat says, Hi, when, Alfred. When using your shooting board, is there a technique to feed the piece you're planing? Is there a technique to feed the piece you're planing? Yeah, you're just always, I'm right handed. 
I'm always pushing the board into the plane, but never harder, I'm never pushing it this way, harder than I'm pushing back the plane this way. So if we move the shooting board, I'd be going like this, not going like that. That keeps your square set up. That's you, don't it. Have to be you don't have to be pushing hard. No, you just have to. You, you just do. have to keep. You just have to keep it fit because this isn't going to go that way, right? This is up against the shooting board. You're just keeping it from moving away. So as long as you're in here, it's going to keep taking a pass off, and it's not necessarily trying to kick it back that way. So just comfortable, light pressure, no great amount. Next, Frick. Uh, Dave Corkum in the chat says, "Hi, Dave. Why not true up the board fence with a table saw sled and a spacer? Why not true up?" The, say that again, please. Why not true up the board fence with a table saw sled and a spacer? Okay. One, two, three of us are working on that. Yeah. Uh, I just wonder if, there's, if he missed, typed a word. Read no, it again. I, I Did he mean to say board edge? No, I think he's talking about Correcting fixing, a fixing a bad fence on your shooting board. By using your table saw sled and and uh, a shim to move. Oh. The, the well, yeah, you can do that. But usually, it's a, it's such a small amount that you're trying to take off that the blade's not going to do very well. And if it, you're using it out of out of um, if you're using uh, Osage Orange, it's most likely going to burn. But then I don't want saw marks on there either. I'd rather have a plane have a nice plane surface. So yeah, I'm being a little persnickety there, but I don't like seeing saw marks on anything. Another one, Frick? Um, if I read you right. Dean Collins in the chat, he says, when making a 45-degree shooting board, how do you recommend getting a precise 45-degree fence slash stop block? Uh, okay, is he talking about a picture frame 45 or is he talking about a carcass 45? I don't know. I don't know. Uh, if, he, if, he, if he has time to restate that question or add that in. Are you talking about a picture frame, two pieces, or uh, four pieces laying flat, 45 degree on the, uh, on each end to make a 90 degree corner, or are you talking about building a carcass where you have a side, a top, and another side, and you're mitering those top corners? Tell me which one. Another one, Frick? Um, 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 I just had a good one. Uh, Bill Smith in the chat says, Hi, Bill. what fence height do you recommend? Billy for Smith played goal for the Newark Islanders. Boy, he was a, he was a wild goalie. What fence height do you recommend for a shooting board fence? What fence height height do you recommend for shooting boards? Oh, you know what? Most of the stuff you're going to be work on is three quarter of an inch. Um, what do we do, Ken? An inch? Seven eighths. Seven eighths. How tall is the how tall is the fence on our shooting boards? The Osage Orange. Oh, seven eighths. Seven eighths. Seven eighths is fine. I don't think you'd need it any taller. I've never I've never needed it to be any taller. Next, Rick. How do you cut the rebate on the shooting board? Ken Thomas in the chat. Uh, on the table saw, set your make the, make the first cut nice and clean, and then drop your blade down so that you're you're only going to cut to within um, you know leave a quarter of an inch or whatever, and then move your fence over so you're just taking a partial cut. Now you can uh, uh, what, something else you can do with that too is you can saturate that area with cyanacrylate to stiffen it up so it'll wear better and longer, make it really hard. Rick? Um, they all questions I see on your screen? No, you see names for the draw. No. Uh, Maxwin76 says, I cannot spray lacquer. Mm -hmm. Is there a wipe on finish you would recommend for a shooting board? Oh, if you can't spray lacquer, I would just, uh, why do we, I mean, we do it just because it's so, it's a nice finish and it's quick and, efe and efficient. But I would, uh, you could oil it. Oil it. It just keeps it clean. Keeps glue from getting stuck on it. If it seems like you're always using something and there's a glue on a piece of wood accidentally and it gets all over your 
wrench or your shooting board. But you could also you can also uh, paint on lacquer. So it, the problem of trying to put lacquer on with a brush, it dries fast. So if it's a big area, one end's dry long before you get finished the other. But on a shooting board, which is relatively small, you could do it with um, you could do it with a brush, not a foam brush, because it'll eat it. All right, Craig. Yep. Let's uh, so wrap it up. So what's our total? Twenty-five fifty-five. Twenty-five. So we're giving away two prizes tonight. We do a, one prize for every thousand dollars. We raise. Uh, plus, we'll also give away three dead cats. Moose wasn't able to join us tonight. It was snowing out. But um, thank you, Moose. I think I got ice for us on Monday. So three, uh, let's give away the three dead cats first. If you don't know what a dead cat is, it's a sweater that is extremely warm and comfortable and light. You can wear it in the summer. You can wear it in the winter. I always tell people, I said, I could wear mine. Mine is 15 out, the wind blowing. Are you ready? Yeah. We're doing three? We are. Let's go. Okay, first winner is Alan McEwen in Ontario. Alan. <laughs> How many times has Alan won? Alan is a good friend of mine. He's a retired university professor. This is probably his fourth dead cat sweater. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you got sat on a horseshoe at some point. Number two is Lane Carter in Arkansas. Hey, Lane. Arkansas, yeah, that'd be cold. Number three is Todd Canberry in Australia. Todd in Australia, which if we're just entering the end of winter, they're entering the end of summer. So by the time it gets to you, you'll need it. Now we're gonna get. I'll, I'll save the dovetail saw for the last. Uh, what else are we gonna give away, Jake? You're gonna need another prize. Well, is that is that other shooting board that you have there? Is any good? No, it's got a big chunk out of it. That's why I'm replacing it's a it. Yeah, right. Um, throw some suggestions. What What would you like for a prize? See if you can come up with something real quick. Watch that. Watch your monitor, boys. What haven't we given away? Can you think? Seems to me there was something somebody donated for us to give away. What, what oh, is it? Here. Oh, Jesse. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Jesse Rufian makes uh, look at these winding sticks. Well, I better give away this. How would you give away a shooting board? Huh? Because Jesse so made these. Unrelated to everything. So this is a uh, this is a uh, what this is a roasted, a light roasted set of winding sticks that Jesse made. Thank you, Jess. With um, holly dots and ebony uh, and ebony uh, markers up top, really nice pair of winding sticks. So let's give that away first. They're made by Jesse Rufi Engine. Jesse makes a whole lot of stuff for us. He's a combat wounded vet. Was the first of two Canadians. He and Kyle in our class back in 2017. Quite possibly the best craftsman I know. Very precise, unbelievably precise. All right, Not good, Kyle. good You're guy. About Jesse. <laughs> It's going to... Actually, you know what? I've seen Kyle's work. What? Kyle does extremely good work, too. It's going to Jake Cosman. Uh, it's not. It says that. Jake Cosman in St. John's, Newfoundland. Nice. All right. Is this is, for... There's you? another Jake Cosman? In nice. Or just did somebody... Just a second. I'm going to check and see if they have an email, like if it's an actual... It's probably... It's probably Kyle. <laughs> it, it is Kyle. <laughs> <laughs> the email the email is Kyle Perel's uh, email so, so that one doesn't we, count so are we giving it to Kyle Why does no he, he probably okay I'm going to go back I'm going to see how many times he put in <laughs> just a second different names yes see what we have to put up with oh no sometimes he's here for a whole week that harasses me constantly that was his only entry. So, yes, Kyle, isn't that, isn't that interesting that Kyle and Jesse were the first two Canadians to come to a class, both in the same class. I was just talking about them, and he won. So, there you go. Oh, the uh, used, beat-up old saw. That's not beat-up. It's in good shape. Who are we going to give it to? Let's see. Going to John Lynch in Waxhaw, North Carolina. 
Hey, John, down Congrats. in Waxhaw. Waxhaw, yeah. Waxhaw, South North, North Carolina? North Carolina. Congratulations, John. He says he really wants it bad. So let me wrap this up. Thank you, Ken, for being here. Thank you, Irvin, for being here. Man in the other camera. Thank you, Jake. Ken, thank you, Frick. I think Luther's on. Yes, he was. Uh, um, Ken's on. Not Ken. Kent. Kent was on. on. Jack on. Jack's on. Jack's on. Those those four make up the. Uh, those four make up the. Board of Directors for the uh, financial side of the Purple Heart Project, which is the 501c3. Ken, any update on the Canadian? Uh, no, we won't until uh, March. So we'll know in March? We'll get an when? update in March. We'll get an update in March on the status of our, um, what do we call it? Nonprofit. Char charitable status. Yeah, charitable status. So that if you're Canadian, you're donating, we'll be able to give you receipts for that as well. So thank you to all of those of you who uh, help out with this. And Devin was on too. I forgot to mention Devin. Um, uh, thank you to you folks for supporting us and helping us out. It's fantastic. I hope uh, as many of you that want to will be able to come to our class sometime. Um, we, uh, we sell out quick, which is great. And I always tell people, I said, you know, I'm so happy. What, the reason we sell out quick is because people are anxious to want to come and be here, part of the program, helping these combat wounded vets. I know it's great that they want to come learn woodworking from me, but it's awesome that they're going to come and be part of that. Um, yeah, we're start, our, our class next class starts in, what, two months? We're in the middle of February, middle of March. Yeah, two months, so we're 60 days away. Yeah, but that's, uh, I get thrilled thinking about it. Anyway, we will see you back in two weeks, Frick. Uh, take a rain check on that. I'm not sure. I well, we'll let you something. know ASAP. Yep. Um, back with a different topic. There's a sale on right now, so anything you need, let us know. Thank you to Gina, who's always in the background and keeps Gina and Pam, Kevin, Ken, Ken's wife, um, process orders with proficiency and speed. It's awesome. We have a really good bunch. Big thank you to our guys in the shop. If I didn't, if I named them all, I might forget somebody, but. They do a they do a great job as well, and they just had four days off. <laughs> Hard time getting them back to work on Tuesday. Anyway, you guys have a lovely weekend. We will see you in a couple of weeks. If you know anybody that would qualify for the Purple Heart Project, combat wounded vet, male or female, doesn't matter. Turn them on to us and uh, encourage them to apply. All right, see you. Get my hat. Don't forget, get yourself a hat. <laughs>